Now the next speaker is another outstanding tribune and a very 21st century man. 21st century in which we have broken the shackles, the chains of billionaire ownership of our media. Proof positive that citizens can become journalists and can speak truth to power. He's another honorable American. He's Patrick Henningsen of 21st Century Wire. Thank you very much, George. Thank you, Greg, for assembling an amazing panel tonight. Thank you, everybody, for coming and everybody watching uh, on the live stream. Thank you for tuning in. This is an important meeting. Title of this series of events is Imperialism on Trial. So I want to talk about this trial. And I took a little inspiration from Harper Lee and a few other people, even Al Pacino. But let's frame this simple as possible. Previous speakers have outlined a lot of great detail. But let's break it down to its simplest parts. What is justice? We're told it's when the guilty are proven guilty, where the innocent are freed. It's very simple, right? Only it's not so simple in this case. We're told the prosecution wishes merely to uphold the laws of the state, and under the protection of the law, the defense should be able to protect the rights of the individual, in this case, a man named Julian Assange. But that's not what's happening so far, anyway. These days, everywhere you turn, you'll see politicians lining up for endless virtue signaling about the need to protect journalists from despotic regimes, media freedom, that's the clarion call du jour this month. World Press Freedom Day a couple of weeks ago. Not a word in support of the 21st century's most decorated journalist currently being held in detention in Belmarsh Prison. Not a word from the National Union of Journalists or Amnesty International. No one wants to defend this man. No one wants to defend this cause. Not so long ago, Julian Assange was the toast of the liberal intelligentsia. Everyone wanted to rub shoulders with this man, with this organization, this man who revolutionized modern journalism. The man, the organization who put the anti-war movement on the front foot, finally. And not so funny enough, in a letter to the Julian Assange Defense Committee on May 17th, Amnesty International UK declared, and I quote, Julian Assange's case is a case we're monitoring closely, but not actively working on. Amnesty International does not consider Julian Assange to be a prisoner of conscience. Not a prisoner of conscience. Presumably, that goes for Chelsea Manning as well, still being detained without charge. Manning's crime is interesting. Her crime is refusing to turn state's evidence against Julian Assange refusing to help invent some new charges to pile on top of an already bloated stack of 18 indictments, superseding indictments filed by the United States Department of Justice. Because the thing is, in America, winning is everything. Make no mistake about it. The United States and its partner, Great Britain, they want to win in this battle. Only, the only problem is they got so carried away with winning 
They forgot to bring their real case. Where is the case? We're looking. It's very difficult, though. We can't find it. Just last week, the U.S. headlines were rife with speculation about whether or not President Trump was going to pardon U.S. soldiers, some of whom are currently being accused and others convicted of war crimes in Iraq. Trump's pardon even goes against the objections of some military officials, believe it or not. Contrast this scene with Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning, two people who exposed these same war crimes. They're being held at the, the pleasure of the Crown and the U.S. government, respectively. The former are currently facing 175 years in a federal prison, back-to-back -back life sentences. So, if there was any real justice, any real due process, then those guilty of the war crimes would be the ones facing the full force of the justice system. But the reality is that the state, the military, they don't really care about those soldiers and what they did overseas. Likewise with Soldier F and so many others. They're trained to kill, and that's the way our militaries want them. But those are just the foot soldiers. They're real criminals. You can go up the chain. It could be the CEO. It could be the generals. But really, we're talking about the politicians and the civil servants, who more often than not will fabricate the case for their deployments. The Tony Blairs of the world, the George W. Bushes, the Dick Cheneys, the Rumsfelds of the world, the Ariel Sharons of the world, the Jack Straws, the William Hagues. And let's not forget Lord Goldsmith, whose 11th hour legal sleight of hand is what paved the way to the worst military disaster of this new century. But, but that's, that's what our legal brains have been trained for, and mind you, groomed for. And these very same legal gymnastics have been used to trap, apprehend, and imprison an innocent man, a journalist, a prisoner of conscience, in prison just 12 miles away from where we're sitting tonight. I had the displeasure, the pleasure, but also the displeasure, of visiting Iraq recently. And let me say, the country is devastated. That's a country, imagine, imagine living in a, a city or a, a town or a village knowing that your village or your town will never be rebuilt in your lifetime. That the school will never be repaired, that the wall, the, the rubble will never be cleared up that clean water will never run through your taps, ever, in your lifetime. You're resigned to that fate. That's the state we have left that country in. And in many ways, it's in much worse shape than Syria. So what's the original sin of the Iraqis? In their post-colonial existence, they chose a path that was different from the sheiks and princes holding court across the Persian Gulf. Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Palestine, Iran, Yemen, all of these countries have one thing in common, they dared to be independent from our governments, our corporations. They decided that they were going to take the plunge, the post-colonial plunge, and for that, our countries in the West have made them pay dearly for dreaming to live out, out from under the colonial jackboot of Europe and a burgeoning U.S.-led post-World War II world order. And pay dearly they have, and profit dearly have our captains of industry and financial wizards of Wall Street and the city of London and so on. Without men like Tony Blair, who we might hear from later, I'm told, or his cousin. There would be no Iraq war, 
and perhaps no WikiLeaks either, and who knows, we might not be sitting here tonight. Assange might not be sitting in a cell waiting an uncertain fate. But where's the case? The case of the missing case. To begin with, this case should never have come to a hearing, to a court, to a trial. There's no evidence that's been produced, only innuendo accusations and lots of hypotheticals, which my colleague Alexander Mercurius illustrated very well. The same goes for the fitted up investigation in Sweden now being revived for the third time. But the US case is even more spacious and upon closer examination, they have no case. There's no new evidence, there's nothing. However, there's prima facie evidence of war crimes which are exposed by WikiLeaks. How do we resolve that? How can you resolve that? So America's legal gymnastics team, world champions, undertook, <laughs> undertook the routine to a high degree of difficulty of reframing the entire story to suit a new raft of indictments, a reframing which transforms Julian Assange as a journalist and WikiLeaks as a publisher to a spy and a cyber terrorist working for a hostile foreign intelligence agency. Imagine that feat. To undo hundreds of years of legal precedent, as well as a decade of international recognition and awards received by Assange and WikiLeaks for their revolutionary work in the field of journalism for exposing the crimes of the state. It's a monumental fraud of proportions that one can hardly fathom only it's happening right before our eyes. And instead of rushing to his defense, to the defense of a colleague of the fourth estate, the mainstream corporate media have hounded him. They've defamed him, slandered him, smeared him for the better part of the last decade. What motivates them to seemingly turn on one of their own? This is an interesting question. I think Perhaps it's guilt that motivates the editorial desks or has motivated the editorial desks of New York, Washington, London, and others, and Islington. Let's not forget Islington. But they've hounded Assange, maybe to assuage their own guilt. Why? They must put Julian Assange away, out of sight, out of mind. That's the right thing to do. It's my firm belief that WikiLeaks and Julian Assange have committed no crime, no crime at all. They've merely broken that long, time-honored code of the corporate mainstream media, serving at the pleasure of the imperial state, a cardinal sin, a slight on the empire, a code so severe that whoever breaks it is hounded from our midst, unfit to walk free am among us, banished from view before the state laid its hands on Assange, bundling him out of the Ecuadorian embassy on April 11th in a blatant act of extraordinary rendition. It was extraordinary rendition. The embassy is Ecuadorian soil. He was rendered. Old habits die hard, Tony. The persecution has been systematic, truth be known, war apologists, enablers, people in the corporate state who would like nothing more to take WikiLeaks offline. And by doing that, destroying the evidence of their offenses, their capital crimes, crimes against humanity. The reality is that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks are a daily reminder of what they have done, what the state has done, what the media has covered up, on behalf of the state and continue to do so in countries again like Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Sudan, Yemen, Venezuela, Palestine, where millions of innocent people have been sacrificed at the unholy altar of profits, of IPOs, preferred shares, no bid government contracts with a guaranteed 35% override.
on costs. Nice business if you can get it. And the political appointments and the gold-plated pensions. Or worse, sacrificed. Sacrificed for a hollow maudlin trope called freedom and democracy. The same altar on which the likes of Madeleine Albright, former U.S. Secretary of State, condemned half a million Iraqi children to death. And in the end, she said, it was worth it. And she's been showered with accolades and awards ever since, honorary degrees, etc. So what did Julian do? He held a mirror up to the Imperium, to this omnipotent establishment, but it wasn't supposed to be. Ever since the 1950s, the CIA have worked tirelessly to gain a foothold in editorial desks of every major publication and media outlet in the U.S. and also in Europe, too. This is well documented. Similar feats were achieved by British intelligence, which shouldn't surprise anybody. After all, there was a Cold War to win. And that brings us to today. The mere act of showing unfiltered news, raw leaks, primary source documents, all of which WikiLeaks has done, it's a veritable showreel of the emperor with no clothes. That is the act uh, which WikiLeaks has done. It raised the bar of journalism. That has always been kept purposely lower, allegedly for national security. So as for journalism, public expectations were raised. This has become the new standard for the 21st century. People crave authenticity. Millennials crave authenticity. They want transparency, and WikiLeaks delivered that in droves. But it horrified the establishment because WikiLeaks broke real stories, too many real stories, bigger than MPs parlaying expenses to remodel their bathrooms and their pied de terres in Marylebone, war crimes, serious war crimes. So there's no room for debate, obfuscation, deflecting. The evidence was right there. We all watched it. Collateral murder. So WikiLeaks broke that corporate media code. Breaking this code never mattered to the mainstream media per se until they were shown up by this new insurgent organization the archetypal digital 21st century media organization, absolutely pure and narrow in its remit. That's what WikiLeaks is. There's been reportage before that's, that's changed public opinion, changed the way people look at conflict and war. Certainly Seymour Hersh's reportage of the My Lai Massacre comes to, comes to mind and so many others. But the state has a natural aversion to this type of journalism. Just last week, the Australian Federal Police raided the home of a journalist in the head offices of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in Sydney. These journalists were covering stories like state spying on their own citizens, not unlike what Ed Snowden revealed, special forces activity in Afghanistan, the same types of things WikiLeaks is, has been reported on. So, the wind is at its back. And with Assange on ice, WikiLeaks on its back heels, the establishment are very confident right now. As John Kariaku, CIA whistleblower, told me in an interview just a few days ago, the forces of anti-transparency are indeed in the ascendancy right now. So should Julian Assange be extradited to the United States? You can be certain on the surface that the state will be brimming with confidence because this case will be heard in the Eastern District of Virginia where the jury pool is most likely to consist of mostly federal employees or family of federal employees, including family or friends of the CIA, the NSA, the NRO, the FBI, and so on. And Assange's case will be heard by a federal judge named Leona Brinkema 
She's what Americans would call a hanging judge because no one has ever been acquitted in a national security case in her court. Only guilty verdicts and plea bargains. And when you're looking at 18 indictments and back-to-back -back life sentences, I guess a plea bargain could seem like the lesser of two evils. So the Department of Justice is very confident, the judge is confident, the jury are confident about what they've read in the papers, what they've heard on TV about Julian Assange. Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, is very confident. He's confident he's read his lines correctly. All of them may be confident that WikiLeaks is no longer a publisher. Julian Assange is no longer a journalist. But rather, in a moral, self-obsessed, power-hungry, narcissistic, attention-seeking man who only cares about his media image, a charlatan, a serial misogynist, Sounds like a lot like somebody else we know. <laughs> Ironic. But, of course, this brings us to the despondent Chauncey Gardner character in the White House, who probably doesn't have a clue what any of this means anyway. WikiLeaks. I don't know anything about WikiLeaks. It's not my thing. That's what the president said after mentioning the publisher no less than 150 times during his campaign. So when reading the DOJ's indictments, it seems brimming with confidence. It's as if they've swallowed every bit of propaganda and defamation about Assange and WikiLeaks over the years, confident he's already been crucified in the court of public opinion. A jury sufficiently marinated in a bath of incessant lies over the last decade. Only it's all a lie. If the people knew the facts of this case, the context, the sweeping implications on future generations, that jury would find Julian Assange innocent of all these charges. Which is one reason why the United States might not fare well if Julian Assange is extradited to the United States. It might be easier and better for the empire if these charges just hung over his neck like the sword of Damocles but not just over Julian's neck. They would be hanging over the heads of every single journalist and citizen journalist on the planet, potentially. This, no doubt, would create a chilling effect on journalism worldwide without even Julian Assange stepping foot into the U.S. or any of its courtrooms. Think about that for a minute. This was force of fiat, and the current president might like this option because it's very economical. And it means that neither he nor the U.S. justice system will have to get their hands dirty by putting the 1917 Espionage Act to the test. Because it's never been tested before, not on a journalist, not on a publisher. If it's put to the test, I believe, others believe as well, that the U.S. Constitution, that precedent, will be on the side of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and America will be finally forced to admit this law is an anachronism. It's out of date, it's out of time. A hundred years, to be precise. The classification system wasn't even invented until the 1950s. And we're already 30 years into the digital age. So by modern standards, this legislation is medieval. And Alexander also mentioned last year the DOG handed down 12 federal indictments to supposed GRU Russian hackers. I'll call these phantom indictments because it's unlikely that any of those people are going to step foot in a U.S. court and defend themselves against those accusations. But the sword hangs over those 12 individuals. Imagine the surprise of the U.S. DOJ when their legal counsel of these Russians <laughs> pushed for discovery recently. The government was like, Whoa, wait, we're not ready to show you any evidence yet. We probably don't have any. That's a phantom indictment. This could very well be what might happen in this case or not. So funny how this, this president is interesting. This president never misses an opportunity to remind the world and himself, donning the red cap, that he's a patriot. 
and how he's prepared to pardon war criminals in order to prove it. And yet, as he stands idly by, his Department of Justice is preparing to lay waste to the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America, a document which is the foundational pillar of America's constitutional republic, a document which he himself swore an oath on January 20th, 2017, an oath to uphold, to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States from all enemies foreign and domestic. And I can tell you, the founding fathers of that nation would be rolling in their graves right now, seeing the First Amendment squashed under the boot of this administration. So it's my firm belief that Julian Assange, if he is to face his accusers in a U.S. court, it will expose the very cheap edifice concealing this coordinated sham with the U.S. and its junior partners, the U.K., Sweden, Ecuador, all colluding in a full frontal assault against numerous international conventions and laws, too many to list. And finally, a fair trial would most certainly expose the illusion of due process all along this story at every turn, the illusion of justice, the illusion of public officials pretending to be serving the interests of the people they pretend to represent. And the cracks in this facade are already appearing. Influential members of the Western media, many editors, politicians have been aroused finally coming awake to the bombast of this power grab that we're witnessing. So this battle will be won in the courts, perhaps, either here in Britain, possibly a stay of execution, as it were, or in the United States, or maybe in Brussels. But the war is going to be won, not in the court across town, but in the court of public opinion. And that's why these community meetings are paramount. It's important that we get together here tonight and again that conscientious writers, broadcasters, thinkers, everyone who realizes what's at stake takes this in and communicates that with everybody out in the world, their peer group, their family, their friends, their colleagues. So again, I firmly believe that in time, Julian Assange will be, no matter what happens, will be vindicated. The question is whether this will be in a month or a year or in 20 years time. That's really going to be done by all of us here, how soon that happens or if it happens. And those watching this live stream as well, just as the state is waging a relentless war against the press and whistleblowers, we also have to wage a relentless defense for the free press, for freedom of speech, to liberate this particular individual who's currently serving in prison, who's innocent. So I'll leave you with those final thoughts, but we, we can't forget, not only is this an important cause for everybody, this is a universal cause, but this man has to be freed and sent back to his family, to his friends. The rest of it we'll take care of after that. But that also has to happen. So thank you everybody for coming tonight. Thank you.